Hello everyone. Welcome to Panthera TV Live. Today we have a very special guest. He is the director of our Puma program and he's going to be talking to us all about his new book. So let's get him in the chat. Hi, Mark. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> good. Is that all right? <laughs> yeah, looks good. So for everybody, welcome, for jo welcome. thank you for joining us. My name is Jamie Zachariah. I'm the Communications and Digital Content Manager here at Panthera. And today we're interviewing our Puma Program Director, Dr. Mark Elbrock, and author of the brand new book, Cougar Conundrum. So welcome. Thanks. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Um, so, Mark, maybe you could just give us a little rundown on your background of what you do um, and what your role is here at Panthera. Sure. Um, at Panthera, I am the director of the Puma or the Mountain Lion program. And what that really means is that I'm kind of the lead person in helping shape the conservation strategy for the species, for our organization. And uh, that means that I get to assess kind of what, how mountain lions are doing across their range and, and sort of think of the strategic actions that we can take to improve the lives of mountain lions and, you know, improve their conservation across their range. You know, it's, I'm one of the luckiest people in the world, probably, in terms of jobs. So. How long have you been with Panthera? Uh, I started in early 2012. Okay. So just over eight years. So what, what has changed in your job from then to now when it comes to studying pumas? Oh, gosh, what's changed? Um, you know, the approach, the technology, the scale of what we're doing. Panthera started, at least in terms of mountain lions, focusing on one single project in northwest Wyoming. And it was a phenomenal project, 17-year-long project in collaboration with Craighead Beringia South and others, and we learned a tremendous amount. But we've, we've started there, and now we've thought, well, how do we actually address um, mountain lion conservation on a much larger scale? So yeah, it was really started as one little project about ecology to now, how do we help mountain lions across their range? And now we're working in the Pacific Northwest, we're working in Patagonia, you've got you know, projects all around the hemisphere. Yeah, we're trying and, uh, and hopefully growing the program as quickly as we can. You know, we, uh, we have new projects on the horizon that are sort of just, just getting going. But yeah, it's super exciting. So I want to ask you a question that we get from a lot of viewers. Um, and it's, why are there so many names for this cat? Um, they're called cougars, pumas, mountain lions. There are some others I'm missing. Why are there so many names? What do you use? What's the story behind that? That's a good question. Uh, I think the, you know, the simple answer is that they are the terrestrial, meaning the, the animal that lives on, on ground, not including oceans, um, but the terrestrial mammal that with the largest range in all of the Americas. So, you know, historically they range from west to east coast and from about a third of the way up Canada, all the way down to the southern tip of South America. And it's just a vast amount of country mm -hmm. that they cover. And because they covered so much ground, they covered so many types of people with different languages and different histories, different cultural relationships with that cat. And so because of that, there were just lots and lots of names for them. Um, at one count, there was 84. They're in the World Guinness Book of uh, World Records for the animal with the most common names. My goodness. And, uh, and so, but to get to your point, what do we use? That It's a great question. Uh, in fact, Emma Wood and Karen Wood of Panthera uh, and I have been kind of playing with, how do we figure that out? And we've been looking at social media metrics and stuff. And there are really strong regional differences. You know, Canada almost entirely uses cougar. Um, the United States almost entirely uses mountain lion, except in three states. Florida, it's always the Florida panther which is a mountain lion or a puma or whatever you want to call it. And in Oregon and Washington, it is predominantly called a cougar. And you'll see cougar sprinkled throughout the West, but overall, it's more often mountain lion. And then when you get south of, of the United States, it is almost always puma. 
And so yeah. <laughs> it really depends on who your audience is and who you want to talk to. Yeah. I mean, that I could see that being difficult, but I do think that those are the three main ones we come across. You know, we call it the Panthera Puma program, but we have a lot of projects called Cougar Projects. Um, and your book, this is a nice segue, is called The Cougar Conundrum. So congratulations nice. on getting that published very recently. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and do you want to tell our audience a little bit about it? Um, sure. It's uh, sort of the nutshell version I've been giving folks is, you know, what is the conundrum? And, you know, it, historically, we tried to wipe them out. We failed. Uh, they have uh, rebounded amazingly, I think, more than anyone would have expected. They're an incredibly resilient species. And they've bounced back to a level now where they're kind of living in between us. People see them on their door cams and their <laughs> cameras they put in their backyards. And we're kind of faced with a new reality. How do we live and share our world, our natural resources with another large carnivore um, and one that is quite successful? And so it's kind of a series of conundrums that I raise in the book, kind of the big ones that people have, like, should I be afraid for myself, for my children? What about my livestock? Are they going to eat all the deer and elk? <laughs> you know, these kinds of questions are, are the themes of the book. And what makes this book particularly so timely right now? Um, that's a good question. I think, uh, you know, there are three things I, I think are worth pointing out. One is that social media, you know, is taking over the world, as we all know. It's sort of reflecting our culture, but also influencing our values and our beliefs. And if you watch social media around mountain lions, it is just increasingly, it's a steady increase of just conflict, of people just slinging mud and fighting, and um, there's tons of misinformation and all of this stuff. And so I, you know, I wanted to get in there and actually play a larger role in education and kind of dispelling myths and also seeding facts <laughs> about mountain lions. That, um, and also, I, you know, I wanted it to be hopefully act as a bridge because, you know, as this conflict is increased in social media and in the world in general, um, I wanted to kind of point out that there are ways for people to connect and that it's really important that we do mm -hmm. if in fact we really want to help mountain lions. If that is our goal, then we need to start building more bridges rather than divides. But, um, and then the last thing I'll point out in terms of timeliness, I think this is really well worth pointing out is that, you know, in culture right now, we're really being faced with the cold reality of the systematic inequality in all of our political systems, our government systems, our cultural beliefs and systems. And this book in many ways is about that. It's about the inequality built into wildlife management in North America and how, you know, it really feeds and speaks to a, a privileged few and that there is great exclusion in who gets to decide what's happening for mountain lions and how the sort of whole wildlife management machine functions. And so, you know, the book and, you know, I'll echo it here is it's a call for greater inclusivity and a greater transparency in, in how we manage and, and conserve our wildlife for all people, not just some people. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah. And I think it's something a lot of us maybe don't think about when we think about wildlife management. We just assume the decisions are being made are including all the voices around the table and we don't realize that maybe they're not and they need to be. So thank you for bringing light to that. Um, yeah. What was the hardest part about writing the book? Oh, figuring out how to do it. <laughs> you know, I had a, a great editor named Erin Johnson and I sent her some initial work and uh, she said, this is great, but this is not actually what we want. You don't write like a scientist. <laughs> Don't, uh, don't fill me with natural history. There's plenty of books on natural history. That's not what we want. Uh, and then, you know, what she really pushed the button was saying, I want your opinions. You know, I want you to tell us what you want, what you think we should do, which, you know, is a really uncomfortable place for a, a biologist. We like to just show data and yeah. let you make your own decisions. <laughs> and, uh, but um, so it was a big, bold step forward. Um, but, you know, in the end, it was the right decision. And and once I knew the form, it just, I mean, this book has been in the back of my head for so long. It's just all the stuff I think about every day. So I just threw it down on paper and here you go. <laughs> well, that's really exciting. I'm, it must feel nice to have your views and your work just, you know, highlighted and being able to get it out to the public. Yeah, it's a privilege to be able to share your view. You know, and I get asked a lot about like, what do you think of hunting? What do you think of hound hunting? Mm -hmm. um, all of these, you know, really 
difficult questions. It's the world is not black and white as we know. It's a thousand shades of gray, and mm -hmm. and it it takes a book sometimes to kind of write down what you think about these things. I can't do it in a in a Facebook post, unfortunately. So it was a real opportunity. Great. I'm I for one am definitely looking. Uh, looking forward to reading it. And I know a lot of um, our audiences as well, and people keep asking, where can they get a book? That's a great question. You can buy your own copy of the book through Island Press, Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, or you can enter, if you are a US citizen, to win a free signed copy from us. All you have to do is, once we post this video on our social media channel, share it and tag us, and I will put you in the running, and eight lucky winners will receive mailed to them a signed copy of the book. So keep a lookout for when this post goes up and maybe you'll get to win your own signed copy. Yeah, and then Island Press too is doing is being super generous. And if you buy direct from them, they have a discount code when you're in the cart. Okay. And you get Cougar, the word Cougar, and you get 20% off, so. Okay, just to repeat that in case anyone didn't hear, the word Cougar is the promo code if you buy your book directly from Island Press. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a fascination with big cats. Obviously, I have it, you have it, everybody here has it. But what's it like to see one in the wild? Oh, gosh, to see a big cat, it's uh, exhilarating. You know, I don't, what's the word to kind of describe? Maybe profound in the sense that, you know, my brain stops, which is you know, <laughs> amazing. Like, I just stop thinking, and there's this animal, which is, uh, you know, I'll admit, it's, it's almost foreign for me. Like, uh, trying to get my head into a, a cat's head is difficult. I can, you know, when I encounter a bear, I almost see their thoughts playing out in their body language and their facial expressions. And with a cat, I always feel they're slightly alien, which kind of makes me nervous. But also, you know, it's so exciting because it's so new and they're beautiful and graceful and powerful. And, it, you know, in their eyes, they have... Uh, a real weight when they look at you, you, you know, it, you feel it like it's a pressure and you're like, Oh my gosh, you know, it's a, this is a powerful animal that you're encountering in the wild. So in many ways, it just is one of those experiences that makes you feel ultimately alive. That's great. I know a lot of us are jealous of that experience. Um, yeah. I mean, and besides pumas, there are other wildcats in the U S and then of course throughout the Americas, do you want to touch on any that pumas often share their home with, or maybe some that we share our home with and we don't think about as much? Oh, sure. I mean, in North America, we have in the far north, the Canada lynx, which is sort of a snow belt cat, mm -hmm. medium sized. And then sort of below them is bobcat range. So all of really the lower 48 states of the United States, uh, parts, the lower parts of Canada, all through Me or sort of half of Mexico is bobcat range, super common in the sense that they're living in between us and people often don't even see them or know that they're there, much like mountain lions. Mm -hmm. And then we move south, we get into jaguars and ocelots and jaguarundis and, and further south, ocelots and all the other central and, and sort of Latin American cats. And um, yeah, I mean, mountain lions live with all of these cats across their range and bears and wolves and coyotes and, and on and on. So it's, a, it's an impressive array. <laughs> So how do you actually study these wild animals that you can't see and how they interact with their, you know, ecosystems, how they interact with the other wildlife? You know, what do you do when you study cats? Ooh, how do we study cats? Um, <laughs> today, I, I'd say there's, let me count them, maybe four big, big methods. So one is motion triggered cameras are playing a larger and larger role in kind of how we monitor and study not just sort of abundance and distribution, but also behavior. Uh, we're seeing, I mean, genetic tools nowadays are massive and, and so important to so much research. So, you know, that could be done indirectly by collecting poop, scats, or mm -hmm. hair from, you know, they rub against things and they leave hair. Uh, so there's lots of ways of getting genetic samples without actually ever touching an animal. Mm -hmm. uh, and then computers, <laughs> I won't, you know, you got to mention computers. I mean, computer simulations and sort of the technology that, you know, there's one thing, there's the technology on the cat side, sort of how we work with cats in the field. But then there's the, the sort of advancements in just our understanding of statistics, mathematics, computer models. Um, and that has just skyrocketed as well. And those are critically important to what we're doing mm -hmm. and, and GIS tools and Google Earth and all of these things. Um, and then, of course, you know, I, I do uh, catch a lot of mountain lions and mm -hmm. 
Um, we use GPS collars. So these are collars that, you know, thankfully are getting lighter and lighter as we continue to use them and smaller and smaller, but they provide us movement data while the, while the cat is actually wearing the collar. So you can see it in real time moving on the landscape and, and what it does. And, and, you know, collars bring pros and cons. And I'm not saying that we all show, always should be catching cats because we shouldn't be. We shouldn't be touching animals unless we really need to. But um, the, the power of collars is really in their ability to allow you to find the animal after it dies. And, you know, as, as um, depressing as that might be, when you build a conservation strategy for an animal, you really need to know what its challenges are and, and how is it dying. And so if you know it's predominantly dying on vehicle, you know, due to vehicle collisions, then that's what you address in your conservation strategy. If it's hunting, then that's what you address. If it's, uh, you know, poison or something like that, disease, uh, then that's what you address. And so these collars allow us to find them after they've hidden themselves, after they've died, and, and to learn how they died. So, I mean, really, really important. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of controversy, and I think a lot of it stems from misinformation around collaring for big cats. Um, and I see a lot of that when I manage, you know, our social media pages. But I like to reassure our audiences that scientists don't just slap on any metal piece they find. Yeah. It's very calculated. There's a lot of science that goes into the technique, the building of it. And I know that you guys are every day advancing that technology to make it better for them, better for you. True, you know, the technology is improving, but, you know, we also should emphasize that it goes through a whole ethical process. You know, there's an ethical review board that actually decides, like, is your research worth doing, considering the risks you're giving to animals, etc. So, I mean, these are, these are, as you said, it's, it's not that we're just out there catching and coloring. We're, you know, there's a lot of thought that's going into this. Uh-oh, we're being discovered, but it's all right. We'll keep going. <laughs> Um, so we have some questions coming in from the audience. One is if pumas are big cats or small cats. Now I can answer that they're big cats, but maybe you could tell us why they're considered big cats. Uh, you know, that's a, it's a great question. And it's based on, you know, this old debate of like, what is a big cat? What is a small cat? Um, some folks, you know, historically did it by morphology and behavior. And so mountain lions can purr. So they go, especially in the den with their kittens and stuff and they cannot roar. And based on that uh, ability to purr, that's a small cat behavior, and the inability to roar, which is usually associated with big cats, they've historically been called small cats. And that has nothing to do with their size. They're the fourth largest cat in the world uh, in terms of weight, although the range, the size of a, of a mountain lion really varies depending on where you are in their geographic range. But um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of where that old historical separation came was that, you know, mm -hmm. they are a small cat because they purr. They were the biggest small cat. And uh, instead of calling them a, a small to medium large cat. Um, but yeah, I mean, these are sort of all falling away as we now kind of rely on genetic tools to sort of differentiate between cats. And, and their closest relatives are, um, you know, historically were cheetahs. And so, you know, cheetahs are considered big cats because of the sort of other features that they have. And, and so knowing that they came from the America cheetah, um, you know, sort of links them more to the big cat lineage rather than the small cat lineage. Right, and from what I understand, big cats sort of all have similar roles in their ecosystem, right? They're the apex predator, the large home range, and those things are kind of similar throughout all the seven big cats, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I think that there is some variation. And, you know, one of the things I like to focus on is these cats that are kind of caught in the middle. So leopards, cheetahs, mountain lions are some of these that are big cats. They're big, they're apex predators, and yet they are subordinate to others, whether that be lions, jaguars, bears, um, tigers, you know, whatever, brown bears, and depending on what range you're looking at. And because they're kind of caught in the middle, their ecological contributions are very different. And in fact, it appears to be that they're really important because, they, because they've sort of adjusted themselves and evolved to live with, with other large predators. They, they contribute more carrion, for instance, to their ecosystems because they've already adapted and co-evolved with species that steal so much food from them. But they just allow that to happen and they just essentially giving food away all the time because of that co-evolution with dominant competitors. That's very interesting. Um, yeah. 
Is there a lot of information out there or enough information to make conclusions on how pumas interact with other wildcats, you know, be it bobcats, jaguars? That's a huge hole in our knowledge. You know, I mean, really the ecological knowledge um, about mountain lions is, is lacking in general, but many large cats. And that, um, you know, it's, it's always been a hole, but because funding for mountain lion research in particular is really driven by the agendas of state agencies and provincial agencies, which, you know, it's not good or bad. They have very particular agendas. <laughs> I need you to sit still. <laughs> and, uh, and so because it's, you know, this is that inequality and in, in sort of access and decision making I was mentioning before, mm -hmm. but there's an inequality in investment as well. Okay. And so mountain lions are just low priority for most folks. And so we just don't know a lot about them. We keep doing the same kinds of research. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. you know, how many times do we need to learn how many deer and elk they eat? Uh, <laughs> how big their range is? I don't know. But apparently we still need to learn more about that because we continue to put money in that, in that type of research. So I guess the big question is, and I don't know if you can even answer is this, is how do we redirect the funds? <laughs> or can we? You know, these are big questions. Um, how do we change sort of this, the power structure, the decision-making processes that are happening in our sort of local wildlife management, our state wildlife management, our provinces, let alone our national? And um, I, I think there's a couple of things that really need to happen. One is that we need to see you know, changed literally at the, well, there needs to be, let me just think this through. There needs to be a, basically a simultaneous uh, set of actions. One is like changing the political structure, which can happen at the state level. We could change how we pick our commissioners that run our state wildlife agencies, um, which are typically governor appointed. So they're mm -hmm. the politicians that represent, they're often friends of governors, you know, they're people they've known for a long time and they give them this, this sort of job. Um, and so that just doesn't make sense. And, and often those wildlife commissioners don't represent the diversity of people in the state or the viewpoints of those people in the state. So we need to kind of work on that level, sort of the political level. We all clearly need to include, increase diversity, inclusivity, and in who we hire into state wildlife management. They should be representative of the people in those states, meaning cultural diversity, uh, diversity of views, values, jobs, whether they work in tourism, or whether they work in you know, some sort of uh, outfitting or any other job that they might have. And then last, you know, to really emphasize that we need to consider how we fund these state wildlife agencies. And right now it's, um, you know, it is predominantly funded by hunting licenses and fishing licenses, so sold to people who want to hunt and fish. And then there's a federal supplement to that that comes from the taxes, the excise taxes on uh, firearms, ammunition, fishing gear, and things like that. But this is by design, and they've excluded so many other sources of money that would broaden their constituency. So we, we really need to broaden the types of money happening in states so that we can, you know, see that Hi. diversify as well. So, right. I mean... I haven't complained. <laughs> I think a lot of people watching, or a lot of people who follow us, would love to get into careers like you and into wildlife conservation. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for those people? Ooh, uh, you know, I mean, being a wildlife biologist or whatever is, you know, there's a fairly straightforward school path in terms of going to grad school, et cetera. But um, I guess I would supplement that by saying, you know, the skills you need, you need to be able to, to navigate in the woods. You need to be comfortable outside. Like just to be able to, I mean, <laughs> this may sound really funny, but like I, I need people you know, I, I think about this because I hire people all the time, right? right? And so I need them to be able to sit down in the, I need them to just sit down against a tree and be comfortable. <laughs> Being like, oh my God, there's bugs around me or oh my gosh, what am I worried about? Or, you know, I need them to be able to spend the night outside. Um, I need them to be able to change a tire on a vehicle. I need them, you know, ultimately, I would love if they could fix a four-wheeler after it breaks. Um, but I need them to be able to identify tracks and sign. I need them to be natural historians. I need them to know their bird calls. I need them to be able to just, to be able to connect the dots outside so that they have good questions as scientists. Not just good questions, but relevant questions. It, it's amazing when you meet, sometimes scientists who just haven't had the background in the, in the outdoors that I've had, 
they just ask the, the oddest questions, you know, they say question, they just don't understand the natural history of this. I think your sound is cutting out a little bit. Mark, can you hear me? I'm tra having trouble hearing you. Maybe if you leave and then come back in. Hold on tight, folks. We've just got a little bit of technical difficulty. I think you should exit and then apply to enter and I'll let you re-enter. Okay, we're going to try that again. So um, while he's working on getting back on, I just, oh, here he is. Let's see. Okay. Hi, Chrissy. <laughs> Hi. Oh, you're back. Good. <laughs> back. I, I went outside, hopefully improved. Oh, we can hear you now. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, and thank you for giving that background. I think a lot of the pe times people answer that question, it's just, oh, well, go to school and get a degree, which, yes, is a very important part, but you're bringing up a good point. You have to kind of learn other things, too, besides from a book, if you want to save nature. So everyone yeah. keep that in mind, those of you who are asking how to get in into the wildlife conservation field. Um, so I want to ask you about what are some of the most recent or interesting discoveries or studies you've done on pumas recently? Hmm. Um, you know, right now I've been working a lot with data from our Jackson project, our Northwest Wyoming. So, you know, this year we, we shared like the prevalence of plague mm -hmm. in the population, which was an astounding percent of the population carried plague or had been exposed to plague. Um, so that was amazing. Um, right now we're, we're about to, or we're kind of in the process, we're doing a revision of a paper that shares um, kind of divides out the impact of human hunting versus wolves, recolonizing wolves on, on okay. mountain lion lives in general. And we found that just 20 wolves was sort of equivalent in terms of the impact on the mountain lion population as all of human hunting in that area, which is not a high level of hunting. There's a low level of hunting in that area, but it was really, to me, really dramatic because it's kind of changing how I viewed the history mm -hmm. of North America. Because if you think Historically, that mountain lions and wolves were both uh, living across the yeah. country, right? Did wolves really keep down the number of mountain lions? And so we really, I mean, it just highlights the fact that we have no idea how many mountain lions used to live in North America. And, and we never will because we don't have a time machine yet that could go back and, and figure that out. But that likely wolves played a very large role in determining how many mountain lions were in specific areas. Um, so that's fascinating. Um, of course, you know, we're continuing to do work on the social lives of mountain lions. And, you know, we shared a couple of years ago some really exciting sort of work on how they're organized and how males play this role in sort of uh, sort of deciding who gets to interact with who and the frequency with the, which they were interacting. And we're continuing to do that work. And now we're trying to link that with hunting and seeing whether there's some threshold level of hunting that sorts of change the social organization of the species. So yeah, I mean, there's tons of exciting stuff that's kind of happening right now and on the forefront. We're, we're studying dispersal here in Washington. We just had a cat, sadly, that died um, during his dispersal. That's, it's been kind of the way it goes so far as many have died. But again, learning how they die has been 
incredibly eye-opening that, you know, whether it's a disease, like we had one that died from a disease that we caught from a domestic dog, um, you know, several have been poached. So we're kind of seeing the level of illegal hunting on, on the peninsula and, and on So and it on. sounds like there's a lot of different threats to pumas. Um, what about climate change? How does that impact them? Or how do you think it will as it gets worse? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, you know, I'll say in <laughs> the short answer is we don't really know. Uh, okay. Mountain lions are incredibly resilient and adaptable. And so we've always, a lot of folks haven't really studied it because they figure ah, they'll be fine. Um, and that it'll be more related to their prey. As long as their prey are okay, meaning elk or deer, which may have a, a sort of an altitudinal migration. Maybe the elk won't go as high or for as long in the summer, you know, as climate change sets in. Uh, or, you know, there'll be changes in forage structure, which will limit and kind of redistribute prey on the landscape. And then cats will just redistribute on top of that. But um, we're actually, uh, there are a few of us who are putting our head together to start to look at the effects of, of, for instance, drought okay. on the home ranges, the territory, the social interactions, all of the behaviors of mountain lions as a way of trying to assess the potential change that may come with climate down the line. So yes, that sounds very tuned. interesting and definitely very timely. <laughs> um, so Puma conservation clearly has a lot of variables and I'm sure those change where, where you're studying them, but Overall, if we had to sum it up, what is the biggest challenge to puma conservation that you see? Oh, it, de it would depend on where. Um, in North America, I'd say, you know, that we can't really ignore the fact of the inequality mm -hmm. in decision making at the sort of state and provincial level for wildlife management and sort of the not just sort of prioritizing certain species over other, which talks about resource allotment, money, um, research interests, conservation interests, but actually seeing the backlash in our country in the last 20 years against conservation success that had been building momentum. And now we're seeing this sort of political reversal, um, a rise in populism that's sort of uh, sort of led to all sorts of changes, you know, uh, ballot initiatives to ban ballot initiatives, uh, ballot initiatives to protect hunting and fishing. And, and I'm not anti-hunting and fishing at all. In fact, I feel those people should be um, absolutely involved in every conservation management plan moving forward. But what I want to see is that we also represent all the mm -hmm. other people as well. Um, is not just a small select slice of the United States and Canada that are making decisions for all wildlife, but that it truly reflects the diversity of people and views in, that we actually live with. You know, that these are the people that are around us. Um, so that's the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, money is always an issue for mountain lions because of that resource inequality or how it's distributed. Um, and the fact that they're not endangered over most of the range. So th there's no extra money for them. And so ironically, most research or conservation action that happens for mountain lions is uh, orchestrated by states out of a state budget, which as we just mentioned is, you know, not prioritizing mm -hmm. mountain lions. And so there's a few organization, organizations like ours that, you know, uh, solicit support from private donors, foundations, etc., to kind of move conservation for the species forward. But I will point out that south of the United States, it's just a totally different world. There's never been an, uh, any research on the survivorship of mountain lions to say what are the, the real threats to mountain lions in Latin America. Um, there are parts of Latin America where we don't even know what, whether they're there or not. Uh, even the IUCN lists them as data deficient or maybe there, maybe not. We don't know where their abundances are. Or, I mean, it's incredible what we don't know south of, of the border. And, um, and for that reason, we we've really are putting a tremendous amount of effort right now into mapping the distribution and abundance of, of mountain lions south of the United States and really trying to build a network of researchers and collaborators throughout Latin America that can help us build sort of a conservation perspective on the species so that we really can make intelligent decisions on how best to help them down there. So, so that's, yeah, th those are and, a few uh, we just had a question from a viewer about Colombia and other countries and what they can do. And I think you just answered that. It's that we don't even have enough data to figure out what they need to do yet. So getting that data, funding research to get it um, is really important because until we have a clear picture of what pumas look like south of uh, the United States, we won't be able to figure out what's best to save them, like you said. That's right. That's right. And, you know, part of it is funding new research, but part of it is just 
building an alliance among okay. the folks who have data because there are tons and tons of researchers who put out camera traps you know not necessarily for mountain lions maybe they're out for jaguars right. or for other species and, if, and we're actually trying to build the network now to just get people to data share so that we can really say well what do we know and then okay what don't we know so we know the strategic gaps to, to do our work but then also you know we are beginning to test real uh, mitigation strategies down there for instance with conflict with mm -hmm. livestock um, our okay. jaguar program in panthera has been doing a great job in central america and we are now expanding south looking at guard dogs and all these different ways of kind of reducing conflict with ranchers um, because that is mm -hmm. where we think <laughs> one of the greatest threats to mountain lions um, in central and south america although as i said we don't really have the data to say that we just have yeah. anecdotes but but it seems to be but that's the case. So, um, so what can we, we being everyday citizens, um, what can we do to protect pumas and wildcats? Yeah, um, I would say, you know, number one would be uh, become more accountable for yourselves. And what I mean by that is be accountable for you, for your families, for your pets, for your livestock, you know, right now, uh, there's a lot of people who believe that state agencies are, for some reason, should be solely responsible for these things. And I would say that's not true, that um, we need to support our state agencies and that we need to share that responsibility. We need to protect our pets. We need to protect our livestock. We need to walk and hike differently in mountain lion country than we would in country without mountain lions. Um, that's just part of it. We need to, to be accountable for, for who we are and what we own and what we do. And... Um, and number two, I, I think we need to, to listen to those who have opposing views from ourselves. Um, as I said, you know, this is not about us versus them. I don't want to see more divides. I want to see more cooperation and more bridges. And so some of these opposing groups on social media that are flinging mud at each other, I'd love to see them actually listen to each other. And uh, I know as strange as this sounds, I, I really do think everyone has an opinion and isn't entitled to an opinion in every opinion is valid, even if it's different than our own. And, uh, and so it's just a good practice to start listening. Stop speaking, <laughs> start listening. Um, and beyond that, I mean, participate. So buy a hunting license uh, is a good recommendation just because it gets you on the email list for the state agencies okay. and stuff like that. But okay. um, participate, go to public comment meetings because they exist, find out about them, meet your local fish and game staff, get to know them, get to know them by name, get them to know your name so that when they see you walk into an office or a meeting, they say, hello, so-and-so, and not just see you as an empty face that they've never seen before. Um, those would make a huge difference because the, if we actually participated, we'd all be included in decision-making. Um, so th there's a lot of things that we can do. And of course, you know, we would encourage folks to support ongoing conservation and research, either through volunteering, um, of course, financial donations, support, but also just mm -hmm. verbal support. You know, like, tell, tell your friends, your family that conservation is good and important and that the work of folks who do conservation and research is important. It's very well, well said. <laughs> um, so I think probably to wrap this up, the last question I'm going to ask you is, what is the, the one thing, the one takeaway you want people to know about Pumas and what you do? Like... <laughs> Oh, the one. No pressure. Takeaway, huh? <laughs> What's your, your lasting message yeah. that you want to send? Um, yeah, it may be a ramble. <laughs> I tend to <laughs> ramble. But, uh, but I guess the one thing I'd say is say, you know, that I like to emphasize that mountain lions are not all the same. Okay. You know, people just assume that they're all, they're equivalent, and that's why they can be managed. We can take 10% of them out of their population, no worries. Um, it's why they're all robotic <laughs> killing machines in some people's heads. They're just, it's just not true. They're so individualistic. Some are better at mothers, some are better, some are more social, some choose to hunt a particular kind of prey. They just vary in every way. They are individuals. They have feelings, they feel pain. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of roll it into my number two, <laughs> is that, uh, that they're part of communities, you know, that they are part of families, and that, you know, it seems to be the research is starting to build an idea that mountain lion survival, the individual's ability to survive in the wild, 
is linked to their communities and so that they cannot exist without a community. And that if we start to recognize that mountain lions are number one individuals and number two linked to a larger community upon which they depend, we, I think, are going to begin to start understanding a little bit about what mountain lions are and, uh, and how they survive in the world. And I, I think I have to add one more thing. Because I think this is another important take home message is that, you know, I think more and more, you know, we're finally getting to the point where our culture is recognizing that natural resources, that environments, ecosystems are important, right? That human health is linked to mm -hmm. natural systems. And, you know, that was a big deal to get people to understand that, you know, my goodness, what you do out there actually matters. And what happens to these forests and et cetera, um, it impacts us. Acid rain, um, carbon dioxide, all of these issues that are coming up in the world because of the health of natural ecosystems. And so if you've made it that far, the last thing I'll leave you with is that in supporting mountain lions, we've found because of their impacts on biodiversity, and ecosystem health and resilience, you are actually supporting healthy human ecosystems. Well said. It really, really is all a circle, isn't it? It really is. Well, uh, Mark, thank you so much for being here with us and for answering our questions. And congratulations again on your book. Um, for those of you yeah, who might have missed the announcement the first time, I'm going to be posting this interview across our social media channels. If you are a United States citizen and would like to be entered for a chance to win a free signed copy of his new book, The Cougar Conundrum, you can share this post and tag us and you'll be entered to win one of the eight copies we have to give away. Um, so everyone, thank you for joining. Thank you for supporting Panthera and um, everyone have a great day. Yeah, thanks everyone. Take care.